Yeah, uh, hello, also welcome from my side. For those of you who still don't know me yet, you definitely <laughs> missed too many courses. <laughs> uh, nevertheless, I'd like to introduce myself quickly. My name is Carsten Tessen. I work for GData, and um, as hopefully all of you know already, um, we are uh, offering an additional evening event every time we have an invited speaker here. So this is the last time for this term, but we will continue in next term. And um, this basically should offer you a possibility to get in touch with the speaker or with people from my company who are working in the more technical field of the antivirus industry. And yeah, we, we offer really a nice evening meal and uh, free drinks and a cozy atmosphere. So if you're interested in joining us later on, um, you can see some of the details here. Uh, if you have further questions, just come to me after the talk. So I would say let's just start with the interesting part. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so first of all, thank you all for being here. Uh, so I, I quickly asked when the school year is supposed to end and you're still here, so I'm not sure if this is like if you're all here on a voluntary basis or what's going on. At my university, all the students are God knows where, but not in class at the moment. Um, so uh, my talk, uh, I came up with the title, uh, I, I don't even remember, a couple of days ago, A Hero's Guide to Taming the JavaScript Beast. Uh, and the idea is that uh, these days when uh, you are opening your browser and surfing the internet, every browser supports JavaScript. Well, barring some freak browsers out there, every browser supports JavaScript. Um, and we are really good these days at confining JavaScript to its own origin. Uh, I, I saw the talk from uh, Mike West. He, he's been talking about uh, CSP, uh, and he's been talking about, uh, well, basically all the standard stuff. Uh, and uh, the, the problem uh, that I have with JavaScript is it's far too powerful. So even if you can confine it, um, it is uh, still allowed to do a lot of stuff in its own origin. So that is why I want to tame this JavaScript beast. So um, first of all, this is, this is me. And of course, the slides are completely messed up. <laughs> but you know that uh, that happens. It's uh, PowerPoint. So um, basically, what this slide says is uh, that I'm a uh, PhD student at uh, KU Leuven, and I'm currently in my last year. Actually, uh, I am in the process of finishing. Um, and what it's supposed to say at the bottom there is the areas in which I have expertise. And the first one is large-scale experiments. I've been doing a lot of large-scale experiments on the internet, uh, a lot of crawling, a lot of processing. Um, but that is not my main research topic. My main research topic is actually JavaScript sandboxing. And uh, aside from those topics, I am also the uh, main maintainer and developer of the over-the-wire war games. Um, and I am the captain of the uh, Hacknam style CTF team at my own university, which we started like a year or two ago. So I, I, I've been told that like these two first tables are my competition because you're like, all like flux fingers. So watch out. Uh, OK, so um, what I'm going to talk about first is active content in the browser. So I'm going to take a step back from JavaScript sandboxing, and I'm going to talk about active content at large. So when you think of a browser, this is typically what I, what I think of when I think of a browser. Um, and I'm not going to go into details like, say, origin policy and what an origin is and things like that, because I'm sure you've been beaten to death with these concepts. So um, here you have uh, the operating system, you have the browser on top, and then you have the different origins with uh, the DOM and then JavaScript engine inside and things like that. Uh, when we talk about active content in the browser, there's three parts that, we are, that I'm going to talk about here. So first of all, we have the, uh, the plugins, then uh, extensions, and then the JavaScript environment itself. Uh, let's, let's first talk about these plugins. So uh, an example of a plugin, uh, Flash, the document viewer, movie players, things like that. So what, uh, what a plugin is, it's a piece of software you plug into your browser. Uh, and it can influence your browser in all kinds of ways. And, um, I will talk about extensions later. What makes plugins special is that they basically have access to your operating system on a very low level, uh, Cisco, um, at, the, at the Cisco level. Uh, so um, we wanted to see. Thank you. 
So we wanted to see, we, we, we did the, uh, an experiment in 2012. Uh, we wanted to see um, for this flash plugin specifically, if there's any security vulnerabilities there that we could abuse on the internet. And so this, uh, this paper is called uh, Flashover with the rest of the title. Uh, so uh, let, let me talk about, about this for a moment. So uh, I don't know how many of you have actually used Flash or have programmed in Flash or developed websites with Flash. There's two ways in which you can embed uh, Flash applications into your website. The first one is you create a object tag and then you put your uh, SWF file, which is the uh, Flash uh, application, you put that in there. A second one, a more interesting one, is to skip this embedding part entirely and just browse to the SWF file itself. And so the, the interesting part here, the, that's why the red arrow is here, uh, is in uh, what kind of security context both, both of these applications run. So the first one, when you embed uh, SWF uh, application from, let's say, Facebook onto your own website, it will run in the context of your own website. So you're basically importing, like you import the code into your own website. In uh, the second case, you serve directly to facebook.com, to the SWF application. It will run and execute inside Facebook's origin. So that is, that should raise some flags here. So the, se the second part is that uh, once you have an application in Flash, typically you want to give it some data so it can operate on something. Uh, and they, uh, Adobe or uh, Shockwave who, or whoever invented Flash came up with this nice way of passing information to Flash applications. Uh, and this is in the case where you are embedding it in HTML. You have this Flash Fars. Uh, maybe I should be looking at these screens while I have them. So this uh, flash vars variable where you can pass information. And that is th the standard way of doing things. But in their infinite wisdom, what they also did is that you can actually append this to the URL you saw earlier. And the interesting part here is that if you are an attacker, that means you can control both the variables that are pushed into this application and the target origin in which it runs. So. Um, let me show you an example here. This is actually, this is a, a cut down version of an application that we found in the wild. And this is really not special because I'm sure if you Google this, you will find it on Stack Overflow or something like that. It's basically an advertisement. And what you see is that there's a button, button 11. And when you click the button and it releases, it will open up a URL. And the URL uh, is given by this underscore root dot link one, which is a variable you pass to the Flash application. So a normal use case for this would be the link at the bottom here, where you just have link one equals and then my nice university. And it will open up a page to, uh, with, with uh, uh, the home page of my university in it. Now what an attacker will do, and I, um, I'm sure you will have guessed it by now, is you can just uh, insert some JavaScript there. And what happens, and this is, this is actually the application that I was talking about. This is on apple.com. Uh, this is on the um, on this their online shop or something like that. So now you have a uh, cross cross site scripting vulnerability in a Flash application, uh, and we have code execution at least JavaScript uh, in the Apple.com origin. So that is that is something really bad. Uh, and then what we decided to do once we learned about this is uh, let's see uh, let let's have a look at the internet, um, and we created this. Uh, this workflow where we basically, given an SWF file, we just uh, decompile it. We had, uh, we had a commercial decompiler for that, which we bought. Um, and then we performed some static analysis on it, very simple. Uh, we extracted all the variables that were used in this strange way and then decided to uh, construct a bunch of attack URLs and then um, proceeded to automatically interact with these applications, which basically means that we had an application that would, or we had a, uh, an automated agent that would open up the page and then randomly click on the application uh, until something happened. Um, and so what we found is we, we downloaded SWF files from the top 1000 of Alexa, which is a standard procedure in web security research. Uh, we had almost 15,000 SWF, SWF files, 
And uh, more than half of them had potentially exploitable variables. And if you drill down on those, you have the 286 that are vulnerable to cross-site scripting. I think six domains of those were in the top 50 of Alexa, which is pretty, pretty decent. So that's, uh, that's where I'm going to leave this hanging for now. So the, the second part I want to talk about when it comes to active content is extensions. And uh, the main, uh, just like, uh, like plugins, uh, an extension is just, well, something you plug into your browser and that can interact with both the user and the web pages. Uh, the, different with the difference with plugins is that extensions are closer to the web pages that you load and farther away from the operating system. Um, so examples of extensions, uh, these, these days every browser has a, the option of having extensions. Adblock is one of them. GreaseMonkey is probably better known. Uh, and I'm going to talk about GreaseMonkey here. So this is uh, based on work that we did uh, and uh, published actually last month. So in, uh, two, two months ago in, uh, in Japan, it was really nice. Um, the paper is called Monkey in the Browser, and the goal of the paper was to uh, evaluate the GreaseMonkey extension and its script market, userscript.org, for security vulnerabilities. So uh, I started my presentation with, with this, so it's no secret that I like the Bambi movie, but what I'm missing here when I go to IMDb is two buttons where I actually can buy the movie because Bambi is no longer in movie theaters. It was from the 40s. So the only way you can actually see it is you can go to Amazon or you can go to, uh, to Netflix or well other websites that I won't mention here. Uh, so the, the problem here is that IMDb is not, really mo well, is not really motivated to have those buttons here. IMDb is actually owned by Amazon. Uh, but let's ignore that for now. Um, what I would have to do to get these buttons there th is actually either get some, buy some stock on IMDb or on Amazon and get these people to put those buttons there. Or another option is actually to render these only in my browser. And this is what we call uh, augmented browsing. So it's a, a very fancy term for what I described here. That everybody intuitively knows that you can do this. Um, and then GreaseMonkey is just uh, an extension for Firefox originally that implements um, an augmented browsing framework. So it was, it's a very popular Firefox extension. It was like the fifth most popular Firefox extension. And this framework uh, is actually adopted by all the major browsers. Uh, but we only looked at Firefox because it was kind of native to Firefox. So how does it work? Normally, when you go to IMDb and you request a page, uh, you just get the response back. And that is where a normal browser operation ends. In GreaseMonkey, what, what happens after you get the page is that a script is injected that has access to the entire page. And that script is called a user script. And a user script looks something like this. So it consists of two parts. Uh, th the bottom part is the JavaScript code that is executed on the page. And the, bottom, uh, the top part there is uh, some metadata associated with the script. And it tells GreaseMonkey where and when it should execute the script. So I am not going to go over all these headers. They're all in the paper. But I'm going to focus on these, uh, these two. Well, actually, only one of them. So there's an include header. This include header just specifies or tells GreaseMonkey on what page it should load uh, the user script. In this case, example.com and everything underneath it, or all subdomains of example.com. The other thing I want to point out here is this uh, GM XML HTTP request, which is a, uh, it's a function that all the GreaseMonkey extensions or all the GreaseMonkey user scripts have access to. Uh, and it's a very powerful version of uh, XHR, which basically ignores the same origin policy. So if you have access to this thing, you can just query any data on the internet, whatever origin you're running in. Uh, so when we go back to the browser, and you imagine that you have the GreaseMonkey plugin installed, so you will have, for example, the alert function, which unfortunately all the browsers have. And then you also have the uh, specialized uh, GMXHR function available. When you go to IMDB, you load the IMDB code into your uh, browser. The um, user script is also loaded, and then the question is, does IMDB have access to this GMXHR function? Because that would be very bad, because then IMDB can just start pulling information from your Facebook profile or 
your webmail or whatever. So luckily, they, they envisioned that this would be a problem. Uh, what the GreaseMonkey developers did is they have this specialized, specialized sandbox in which these special functions are available. Uh, the user script is loaded into that. It has access to this function. And once the user script is done running, is done running the, the sandbox is destroyed. So no references can leak out. And we actually we ran into some problems uh, with these references leaking out. Uh, so actually, GreaseMonkey is really well coded, and they've foreseen most security problems, uh, but not the ones that we had in mind. So uh, the first one is um, DOMXSS. Um, we looked at all the scripts on userscripts.org. Userscript.org is the script market for GreaseMonkey. And um, we parsed all the scripts, and then we started looking for possible DOM XSS. Remember that user, script, user scripts run with special privileges, and if, if you have DOM XSS on these, that might be kind of bad. And so what we found out is that we had about uh, 86,000 user scripts, and uh, 1,700 of those actually contain DOM XSS. And our analysis is far from complete. We used a very simple approach to check for DOM XSS. Uh, so now, if you remember, like two slides ago, I mentioned this sandbox. Um, so a sandbox is, is all fine and dandy, but if an attacker can control what you execute inside the sandbox, then that is a problem, I especially in this case, because inside the sandbox are all the privileged functions. And so when we looked at all the DOMXSS uh, vulnerable scripts on userscript.org, we found that 79 of them use the evolve sync, which means code execution. 60 of those uh, expose the GreaseMonkey API, which means that the code that you evolve is running inside the sandbox and has access to, for example, this GreaseMonkey XHR. So that is very, very bad stuff. But now remember that in order to exploit this, um, the user script must actually be triggered. And if you remember, there was this include header which specifies on, on what side a user script is executed. So that's kind of a safeguard. But we found another problem. <coughs> so if you look at how this include header works, you will see that GreaseMonkey uses the a regular expression matching to match the entire URL. And it has this star character, which is like any regular expression will do it like this. Uh, it matches any character. The problem is then, if you look at the example, if we uh, match all the subdomains of example.com, we can just insert a slash in there and have the script execute on any website that we want. This is, this is very bad. So we, we've called this uh, vulnerability overly generic include header. Uh, and we found that 60% of all the user scripts on userscript.org are vulnerable to this thing. And so if you combine both of these, uh, you will see that an, an attacker has the ability to execute any code on any web page and have access to the privileged um, functions inside the sandbox. This is a very explosive mix. Uh, so, and all in all, we have 58 scripts on uh, userscript.org that match this description. And this is like a, a well, uh, a lower boundary because there's going to be a lot more. Our, our uh, evaluation was not really that thorough. So the most prominent script that we found had 1.2 million installations. And uh, if you look at the, the paper, you will see that there's a nice video where we actually exploit, well, where I actually exploit my own browser and show that uh, on an attacker website, the attacker gets access to my Gmail contacts, which is not supposed to happen. So let's review so far. I've uh, talked about uh, two ways of uh, active content, and there were three. And if you look at the plugins and extensions, we're not doing that great so far. So the, the browser is a really bad place uh, to do secure business. Now, um, we shouldn't be panicking at this point, because basically, the attacks I've described so far are just content injection attacks. Uh, no matter how you look at them. And they will probably kind of soonish be dealt with and solved, right? So if you look at Mike West's talk, I know he was here, and he has, he has given a couple of talks on the use of uh, uh, content security policy and cross-site scripting protection. 
we can kind of hope that this thing will be abolished from the internet. So let's just skip this for now. Let's not look at the content injection part and just look into the future. So imagine for a moment that we have a, a future where there's no content injection and code is only executed um, where it's supposed to run. Uh, and it only has access to what it's given. So will the internet be saved then? So, and of course, I'm not talking about CSS and SVG stuff. I mean, that's a completely, we call that out of scope in academia. So uh, will the internet be safe? Well, the question first that you must ask is, what is it actually that JavaScript can do even if it's allowed to run? And that is also a very interesting uh, question. In, uh, in 2012, we did some research on HTML5, which at that point was kind of new. Uh, and we looked at all the new types of functionality that it was offering. And so if you imagine this is just b basically your browser, don't look at the, the, the fancy words there. That's not really important right now because I just reused the slides. So I'm already missing one icon. Uh, so we have these uh, new media facilities where a browser can just natively support all kinds of audio and video controls, uh, including media capture. There's uh, all kinds of uh, user interface and rendering facilities uh, for 3D stuff. There's drag and drop the, clip uh, the clipboard things, notifications. We have intermessage uh, communication, basically sending messages between origins. We have client-side storage, aside from cookies, like local storage, uh, session storage. Uh, index DB, which I'm actually not sure at this point if it's still supported or not. Um, there's external communication. The most interesting here would be uh, WebSockets and then upgrading uh, XHR from version 1 to version 2, where you can now actually connect to any website you want as long as the server supports it. And then finally, all kinds of device access information uh, like geolocation, crypto services, and all that fancy stuff. So. Now that you kind of know, this was in 2012. In the meantime, we have had a whole new bag of tricks. Uh, so I, I do have a question now. So I suppose that everybody knows these guys, right? The A team. So suppose that you have a uh, fortress and suppose that you're, well, let's suppose that you're the good guys. And you see these guys running around in your yard and you decide, well, I'm going to detain them for questioning. Would you lock these, these guys up in a workshop like that? Because that's what happens in every episode. The obvious answer here is no. You don't do that. But that is exactly what we're doing in the browser. So instead, what you want is something like this. You want a jail with nothing inside. And hopefully, but it's not here, one or two guards outside that keep an eye on them. Um, so the, the moral of this story is actually that in a, in a browser, we just keep pulling in random content from the internet and then putting it in, in an environment where they have access to very powerful functionality. But uh, wait, wait a minute. So I actually expect this question to come from you. Am I telling you that there are website developers out there that are running untrusted content in their website? Well, obviously the answer is yes, but let's suppose you don't know that. We did, again, some research. This is from 2012. And the goal of this research was to look at uh, remote JavaScript inclusions on the web. Uh, who is doing what and what kind of content are, are they including? And so well, what we did is one of the large scale experiments, by the way. This is probably one of the biggest ones we had done uh, up, to, up until that point. We went to the uh, uh, Alexa top 10,000 websites and we queried 500 pages. That's 5 million web pages, which is like. Uh, from those, we had 3.3 million pages, which were actually HTML. And then we discovered that there's eight and a half million pages, uh, eight and a half million remote JavaScript inclusions coming from 300 thousand-ish unique files uh, spread over 20,000 remote hosts. Now, imagine that one of those hosts gets infected and you can upload whatever you want. 
What do you think the impact on that is of that is on the internet? So we have to be honest here. So a lot of these, this is the top, the top ten, I think, of the most popular includes. Uh, and what you see there is the ones you expect, like Google Analytics, and you have Facebook buttons, and you have all kinds of uh, tracking things. You, I see Twitter there. And um, you will see that five of those ten are actually owned by Google, which is not surprising because we all know that Google, at, at least at that point, owned like 80% of the internet. God knows what it's now. But uh, if, if we, we look at it more closely, so this is a, a histogram of how many remote hosts uh, content is included from per uh, website. You see that on the, on the left here, most of them are situated here. So most of them like one or two JavaScript files from remote hosts. Typically, that will be Google Analytics and then maybe Facebook or something like that. Uh, but if you look very closely on the right there, I'm not sure you can see that. We see that there's at least a couple of websites that include content from more than 290 remote hosts. That's, that's an insanely big amount. And that is actually, that is just the outlier. But if you look at the rest, like in the middle, everything beyond 100 should raise some flags. I mean, actually everything beyond 50 probably. Um, that is a problem. So this just shows that um, website developers are actually, for some reason, running code inside their web page that they don't know or don't trust. So what can we do about this? Well, one obvious answer is we're going to abolish JavaScript completely. And I guess that if you made it to the end of the class and you answered this on an exam, you're fired. So this is not something we can do. I mean, there's, I don't know the exact number, but it will be close to 100% of the sites on the internet. Again, barring some freak websites that are using JavaScript. So another thing we can do is let's stop using untrusted JavaScript. But uh, how would you do that? So for example, if you want to create a website that shows the Google Maps API, you need to include content from Google. There's no way around it. You can't just download the JavaScript libraries from Google onto your own website and then expect Google Maps to work. It will work for some days, for a couple of days, but then it will stop working because Google constantly updates their script. So we can't do that either. The third option is to actually restrain the interested JavaScript Instead of giving it full access to all the functionality, just limit uh, to what it has access to. And that is what I mean with taming this beast. So how can we remove this functionality from JavaScript? So um, from now on, I'm just going to talk about JavaScript in web pages. So what I said before about the active content being plugins and extensions, I'm, well, just ignore that for now because, you know, in 50 years or so, that will definitely be solved. Let's look at the typical JavaScript inclusion scenario. In the middle there, that's us. We are the visitors. And we are visiting a website, puppyshelter.com, because I needed the most friendly website I could find. And on the other side, you have evilskeletor.com because he's the most evilest bastard on the, well, in the galaxy, as far as I know. And for some reason, well, I can think of some reasons, but Evil Skeletor runs an uh, advertisement agency, and puppyshelter.com wants to advertise, or it wants to show advertisement because they're basically a charity. Um, so what happens in, um, in the visitor's browser is that once you load puppyshelter.com, it will fetch content from evilskeletor.com and execute inside the origin. That is basically it. So let's uh, consider this scenario. Uh, obviously, Skeletor hating everything also hit puppies, and he wants to show that to the world. Um, when you load uh, the puppyshelter.com website, you will also pull in the third-party JavaScript. It will execute, and in this case, it will show a pop-up. But of course, this is, well, you can think of far, far worse things to do at this point, right? Or I, sh I should hope so. 
So if you consider this scenario, there are three places where you can solve this problem. And I'm going here from right to left, uh, because that's what was nicest on the slides. So the, the first one is, um, let's actually modify the, uh, the JavaScript code that is going to run in our, in our website. Uh, and there's a problem with that. So um, if you do that, what happens is that the visitor is no longer going to be pulling JavaScript from puppyshelter.com directly, uh, from uh, evilskeletor.com directly, but it will go through a proxy on puppyshelter.com. And this breaks all kinds of stuff. So uh, Google has tried this with Kaha, and Facebook has, uh, well, at some point they had Facebook.js, which they abolished. And then there's Microsoft has a browser shield. They all work with some kind of proxy. And the problem is that this approach breaks the architecture of the internet. So if you think about uh, AJAX calls, and uh, if you want to have authenticated AJAX calls, now we will be going through puppyshelter.com, which means that cookies won't be sent anymore. And even if they are sent, that means you're leaking cookies through a third-party website, which is a really bad idea. So when I started my PhD, this was basically uh, all the big fuzz, and people started realizing this is not a good idea. So let's, uh, let's go to the second one. So uh, the second approach is we can modify the browser. That's, that's always cool, right? So because uh, being an engineer, modifying things is really great, and building stuff is really great. The approach here is that we will allow Evil Skeletor to execute code in our web page, but only in a sandbox or in a jailed environment uh, that we create inside the browser. And there's a couple of approaches here. So uh, Conscript, which is uh, Microsoft's uh, solution, um, was one of the first. And then uh, I will be talking about, about WebJail here, because I made WebJail. So, um, so um, the, the goal of WebJail is to, run, uh, to, to restrain this untrusted JavaScript by modifying the browser. So how did we do that? This is the architecture. And I, I like to include it, because I spent a lot of time creating this, this, this figure, uh, because of the nice shades of gray. So you see the dotted line in the middle there? And that is what separates the browser core from the JavaScript layer. Everything on top in JavaScript is running inside the web page. Everything below it is running inside the browser in the browser core. In, in, in this case, it was a modification to Spider Monkey, uh, to, to uh, the JavaScript engine in Firefox. Uh, so if you start at the bottom, uh, at the top, wow, uh, you start at the top. We have a policy layer, which is basically uh, a layer uh, in which a web developer can specify uh, what kind of functionality wants to allow in a, um, in a sandbox. Then we have the advice construction layer. Those are fancy words. Basically, uh, it will translate the policy layer into more specialized instructions. And then we'll pass that to the deep aspect weaving layer, which will actually combine um, these JavaScript functions with underlying C++ uh, plus plus structures. Uh, if you, if you look, uh, just look at the deep aspect weaving layer, because that's the most interesting one. Um, this is inspired by Conscript. Uh, the idea, if you look at the figure there, the black line represents the, your flow of JavaScript when it's executing in the JavaScript environment. As long as you are just executing JavaScript and not touching anything of the DOM, this is just code that is running without side effects. You can add numbers, you can multiply numbers, you can uh, combine strings, whatever you want. But as soon as you call a DOM API, then you will uh, get a trap, and that will uh, get you inside the browser infrastructure. And that's what those blue boxes uh, represent. So in this case, let's, let's suppose that we want to call the alert function, because that's always the easiest one uh, to debug anyway. When you call the alert function, you will call one of the blue boxes, which will get you inside the browser infrastructure. It will open up uh, a pop-up. What we do with WebJail or with the deep aspect weaving layer is, um, instead of the JavaScript calling the alert function itself directly, it will actually call something called the deep advice function, which in turn has the option of calling the C++ code, but it doesn't have to. And uh, this does not have to is actually the key to the enti entire advice function, because that is where we enforce the policy. So uh, if you 
want to look very deeply into the code. Uh, it's, it's based on Firefox 4.0, and I, I had the impression here that some of you will be working with Firefox things, or, but my German is not that great. So um, there's a reason I don't want to look at Firefox code anymore. Um, so what we did is in, in, uh, in Firefox, in the, in the SpiderMonkey JavaScript engine, every function is encoded as a JS function object. That's what you see at the left, by the way. The, the well, if you split down the middle, the, the left side here. This is the, the normal operation of um, a spider monkey is that you have a JS function, and when you call it, it will call the original code. That's basically it. Uh, on the right, that's, that's what we have after we register one of these advice functions. Uh, and what you see there on the, on the right box, you have a JS function called advice which is now linked into the original function, and there's a lot of pointer spaghetti going on. But basically, what it does is if you call the function, it will call a trampoline, which calls the advice function, which may call the original code. It's kind of complicated. This is an example of creating advice. So maybe this might clear it up. So um, basically, what this function does is it will, can I select it here? Probably not. Uh, what this function does, it, it returns another function which encapsulates the original function. In this case, we register advice for the window alert. That's the last line there. Register advice for window.alert. And the advice function itself uh, will only allow the hello world and test message to be shown. If you pass anything else, it will just return false. So this is basically how we enforce the policy. Um, the problem with WebGL, uh, despite being, being horribly written in Firefox, uh, one of the problems with WebGL is at least that it blacklists all the sensitive functionality. So in this case, we uh, wrote a wrapper for alert function, but nothing else. Uh, what that means is that if you call geolocation and the web developer was not smart enough, to have an advice function for geolocation, then it will not be protected. So, and that is, that is bad because it's not just a bad design decision, but it's very hard to keep up with all the new functionality that's available in a browser. Never use blacklists. It's always a bad idea. But the worst problem here is, and that's a problem that occurs with every browser modification. The worst problem is that uh, you cannot deploy a browser modification to the entire internet. That is just, you, you can't do that. So the, the other option would be, well, you can just call the W3C and have them adopt your modification in the standards. That is, that is even a worse idea. Um, unless you are a browser vendor with a lot, of, uh, a lot of influence, you're not getting anything into the standard. So let's scrap this idea. Uh, modifying a browser, really a bad idea. So what remains there? We can work with existing tools. And what that means is, since uh, HTML5 and ECMAScript5, they have some very powerful functionality. And well, kind of by definition, it will be adopted by all the browsers if they want to keep uh, up to date with the internet and render all the web pages. Uh, this means that using HTML5, ECMAScript5, and all the new functionality, that is actually the future if you want to enforce or if you want to do some kind of JavaScript sandboxing um, well in a realistic time frame anyway. So there's a couple of examples here. The first one uh, CSP plus the iframe sandbox is actually an idea from Mike West. Uh, it's something they use at Google and I believe he talked uh, on DevOps 2012 or 2013 and I really invite you to Go look at this talk. It's very, very interesting. We actually used this idea in another paper. But um, the other two are JSON and Treehouse. Treehouse is from the University of, uh, of Texas. And JSON is, well, again, one that we created. And the goal here is that we want to restrain JavaScript, but without any browser modification. And so how does that work? So when you have the embedded page, remember, there's no browser modification at all. So we load. JSON inside this page, which is a JavaScript library. Then we pull in the third-party JavaScript, in this case from evilskeletor.com, but it is not yet executed. Then we build a nice 
uh, object capability environment using Google's secure ECMAScript library. And then we put the third-party JavaScript inside of it. And I will, I will get back to all of this. Um, and this, um, this object capability environment, uh, using a membrane pattern, by the way, uh, we filter all the access going to the DOM. So if you look at uh, an example here, a code example, again, we use the window alert function because it's so great. Uh, instead of just calling it inside the environment, we actually use SES, the secure ECMAScript library, um, to execute this inside of a sandbox. And the sandbox basically looks like this. There's this uh, variable called catchall, uh, which is made somehow, and I will also get back on that. We use a with construct, which basically uh, pushes this object uh, onto the, um, uh, the in, into the scope chain. Uh, and basically, everything that you look up from that point on is referenced against catch-all. So if you want to call window.alert, it will be looked up in the catch-all uh, object. And then we use strict mode, because strict mode is also a very good idea. Uh, basically, that's to, to make sure that we're not creating global variables uh, all over the place where it shouldn't be making them. And it just clean, it makes uh, for a lot cleaner JavaScript code. So the... Um, this uh, catch-all um, variable that I talked about, that is actually a proxy object. It's also a, a HTML or an ECMAScript 5 functionality. The uh, a proxy object will mimic uh, another object and just intercept all the calls and all the variable lookups that you do to it. So, and that is very interesting when you're building a sandbox because now you have access to everything that is requested of this object even when uh, you don't expect some variables to be there. So in this case, if we would have neglected or if we didn't know of the existence of geolocation, <coughs> the proxy object would still trap the access to geolocation. Uh, I could go over this, but let's see. I'm already at 40 minutes, so let's uh, skip this part. It's all in the paper anyway, and there's a, a demo of this on, on the website. So. What is the best approach? Well, I've already hinted towards this. One, definitely out. Two, don't start with, don't stay away from browser code. So, in my opinion at least, sticking to standards is the best approach you can have because it will be supported on all the browsers and typically standards don't change that much. But basically, once it's a standard, it will never go away. They will invent new standards to fix the old standards, but they will never fix the old standards. Um, so uh, a problem with sticking to standards is that the web is constantly changing and there will be new extensions added. There is no silver bullet to this, to this problem. You can't really fix it. So my advice uh, to selecting the best approach is actually to just think on your feet and anticipate the security problems. Um, and that is, that is why my slides were white, because now we're going to the other side. So um, what I've learned in my academic, the, the last four years actually, is that I built a lot of prototypes and uh, it's been a lot of fun. And the scientist in me is really happy that I built all these things, but the engineer in me is not really happy at all, because I have to be honest, when we were building WebJail, um, I had more segmentation faults than I've ever seen in my life, and it was mostly because of the garbage collecting. And very, uh, I'm not going to rant about Mozilla, or at least not about Firefox. Um, when it comes to WebJail, I am definitely sure that it doesn't cover everything, for the reason I said, because it uses a blacklist. When it comes to JSON, I am not 100% convinced that it completely isolates the untrusted code from the main page. And the reason, um, actually that, that hurts me as, a, as an engineer because I want, want it to work all the time and I work, want it to work well. Um, and the, the reason that I think that these academic prototypes, well, they're called academic for a reason. Somehow when people say that's an academic argument, you know what that means. It's the same with prototypes. If you download an academic prototype, chances are it's not going to work in the setting that you want. Um, and the problem there is, uh, that I see, is that um, not enough people are getting their hands on it. So there's a 
a difference here between theory and practice. So in theory, all of this stuff should work. And in practice, well, sort of. So I'm not the first person to think that practice is an important part of science. So I normally have a, a long rant about this. I mean, I have an entire slideshow and an entire slide deck just to promote war games and to promote hands-on uh, security expertise. But I'm not going in here because we're, well, I had 60 slides and I was not going to do that in the time allotted. So let me show you this guy. Everybody knows this one. So this is a, one of the famous quotes. This is Einstein basically saying that um, the only way that you can learn is by experiencing things. Again, hands-on stuff. This is, uh, this is Aristotle uh, basically saying the same thing, that if you want to do something well, you need to do it over and over again. And uh, well, let me come, come back a bit to the present. This is actually something I looked up on the internet. Can you read that? So this is a book about swimming. I thought that was particularly funny. Uh, because if you look closely at this image, you will see that the people there, they're not actually reading a book, but they're in the water and they're swimming. So I, 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 I think it's kind of funny that you would write a book about swimming. This is only something that you can learn by jumping into the deep end and actually do swimming. So let me talk about learning security by doing. And I've been told that this is something that you do in this course. So excellent. So there are a bunch of, um, a bunch of resources on the internet that can help you with uh, learning by doing. Capture the flag, well, you know, at least almost half of you are at least participating in CTF games. There's also war games and all, all kinds of uh, uh, online and offline challenges that you can play. And those are meant to provide a legal means for you to practice uh, offensive security skills. What did I write? It's also a safe means to practice defensive security skills. That's also important. So normally, if you are new to security and you put a server on the internet, it will get hacked in, I don't know, minutes? Well, if we're not talking about Windows, it might be longer. Windows has, has a really bad security record. Um, training offensive security is easier because, in theory, you could hack any server that you want. Uh, the problem is, of course, that they might find you and put you in jail. Uh, defensive security skills, training, that is also very easy if you can afford it. You can keep putting servers online and people might keep hacking them and you will learn something from them. But that is probably a very bad idea. So uh, I'm going to talk uh, about this uh, over the wire games that I run, um, of which the link is not visible, but if you Google it, you will definitely find them. This is just a, uh, you know, a, a quick uh, promotional for us. Um, at the moment, we have uh, 11 games online, of which three are downloadable. And uh, the challenges that we have, they are for new players, ranging to advanced players. And uh, these are just categories in which we have all kinds of levels and challenges, low level, network crypto, shell scripting as well, web security, and so on and so forth. And uh, this, is, this was basically the state and, uh, of the over the wire games until uh, last year. And, August or something like that. Uh, since then, I've been working on a new setup for Over the Wire, which is called the, uh, the War Zone. And um, it, should, um, it should help Over the Wire provide some games that were not possible previously. Basically, the War Zone is a, an isolated VPN where you can connect your client and you can attack servers like you used to be able to. Uh, so the offensive part hasn't changed that much, but the defensive part has changed because now you're also able to connect your own servers to this war zone. And basically, the rule will be that anything you connect is just pawnable. So, I mean, don't have any expectations that someone will overlook your server. Um, this is basically like, like the internet, uh, but in, uh, in miniature. Um, the new opportunities that, uh, that we have with, with, this, uh, with this setup is that we can now offer Windows war games, uh, kernel levels, uh, which were something you cannot do on a, uh, a VPS if you buy them, uh, Android things, uh, stuff with robotics, and uh, which is something that's more in context for this uh, talk is that we'll also be providing client-side security war games. So basically, we have a bunch of, bunch of uh, browsers visiting web pages all over the place, and you can do cross-site scripting and C-surf, click-jacking, whatever you want. And if you think up a new 
way of attacking things or a new way of defending things, you can just plug it in and have people uh, go nuts on it. So, if you remember well, and I hope you do because you know it's a nice day, it's the like end of the year, might get, well, I'm not going there. Um, the title of the talk was actually The Hero's Guide to Taming the JavaScript Beast. So I should probably get back to this. So what I've, what I've been talking about is this. The uh, enemy in this case is that JavaScript has access to lots of functionality. And you know what must be done. We must limit this functionality. You also know what has been tried. Uh, I've, I've gone over uh, all the stuff we've been doing uh, and some of the stuff that other people have been doing. But the enemy, in this case JavaScript, is very cunning and it's changing all the time. So in order to stay ahead of the game, you have to adapt. You have to think on your feet. And what that means is that you need to train your skills, outsmart the enemy, and just practice the hell out of everything. That is the only way you can learn, by the way. That is by doing it in practice. Don't read a book about swimming. That's OK, so I don't have the certificates, but I think that you've now <laughs> all officially uh, superheroes. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to give this talk and for listening to me.